Ladies and gentlemen, valued clients and guests, welcome to our webinar. We hope that you are safe and healthy during these unusual times. And we are going to talk about a topic today that has stirred quite some controversy over the last couple of months, especially during the Corona crisis. All markets suffered, but the Chinese one suffered least. Now there's obviously healthy skepticism about this whole situation and we are asking ourselves is China lying about their data um, or you know is there something else behind it so let's talk about uh, China and something that is a little bit uh, more interesting than just China itself basically we are talking about a fund that has really outperformed all other funds in the market and with me today is Stefan Kreuchy he is the CEO of HSZ Group in Hong Kong, and he's also the co-manager of the China funds that they're managing. So, Stefan, you uh, are in China. I see the Chinese wall behind you. <laughs> or is that just, uh, is that just um, a cheat? Not really. No, it's thanks to uh, the technology that uh, we can uh, put ourselves wherever you like to be these days. <laughs> That's or amazing. Very so, uh, anyway, you are somewhere in Asia, and uh, Stefan, talk about yourself a little bit. You know, uh, introduce yourself a bit. What's your story? What brought you to Asia in the first place? Well, I always had a very strong affinity to to Asia, and also through my wife, of course, as uh, family ties to that part of the world. Uh, and moreover, in um, 2011, after having worked for um, UBS and uh, Credit Suisse and AIG for more than 20 years, I wanted to try my, to be an entrepreneur and start my own business. And so in uh, 2011, I um, was invited by Hans Udo Schmid, who is the founder and chairman of HSZ Group, uh, to start my new venture on the roof of the HSZ in, in Hong Kong. And so I moved with my family to Hong Kong in 2000. And 11. Well, it seems like you're more Asian than, that, than I am, you know, you've spent so much time in Asia itself. And you, you mentioned that you started the HSC China Fund in 2003, uh, and then you uh, sort of changed it to a Swiss fund or a fund on Swiss law in 2006. Can you tell us what the original idea was behind it when you launched it? Well, that was way before my time, of course. Yeah, the, as you say correctly, the strategy itself with the same approach was, was launched in 2003 as an investment company under the name of China Investment Corporation and then uh, transformed into a Swiss fund in, in 2006. But the idea at that time and today was the same. It's a long only actively managed fund that invests primarily in entrepreneurial China, meaning in, in listed Chinese equities that are controlled by private sector and are not owned by the government. And so that's, that's still the same idea, nothing changed in that respect. We, today we can invest in uh, different share categories, of course, we can invest in the eight shares that are listed in Hong Kong, but we can also invest in eight shares that are listed uh, in the mainland China. And moreover, of course, we could invest in Chinese uh, companies that are listed somewhere else, be the US or even other into places. The important thing that needs to be fulfilled is that all these companies need to do the majority of their business in mainland China. Well, it seems that the Corona crisis suggests that local expertise in China can still help to generate alpha. So your fund outperformed the MSCI China index by roughly 18% since the beginning of the year. And you beat other actively managed China funds by lengths. But let's talk about China first. Where do you see the reasons that China's markets perform better than the rest of the world? Well, as you know, the Corona virus or the crisis started in China. But China took uh, very aggressive measures early on to minimize the outbreak. As you know, they locked down over 60 million people in, in Wuhan and the surrounding areas in order to stop the spreading of the virus. Um, 
I think thanks to those drastic measures that, that China took, but probably also due to the discipline of people, you know, in, in China, in order in, in order to follow government um, orders, I think China was able to stop that uh, faster and, and to come out faster out of this crisis. Moreover, of course, the Chinese government has, as many other governments in the world, has taken some measures, has uh, put in place uh, uh, some stimulus response, uh, including some uh, injection of liquidity in the financial system, but also tax concessions and uh, subsidies to certain subsidies to, to certain um, companies and, and individuals. And uh, as a result of that, the IMF came out recently and is expecting that China will uh, or be able to recover and, and probably should even have a slightly positive growth for uh, 2020, whereas the rest of the world is going into a recession and is probably on the different economic blocks like Europe and US probably will show quite significant negative growth rates for 2020. But despite that, we believe the investment case for China is unchanged. China is still the second largest economy in the world. They're not stuck in the middle income trap, unlike many other um, countries in, in Asia or also in South America. China has a stable and, and solid leadership in place. And also the positioning of international investors still doesn't reflect the weight of China in the world today. Well, then let's move to our fun. At the moment, the HCF, as we call it, the High Set uh, China Fund, is one of the top funds in Switzerland. So congratulations for that. Morningstar awarded us a five-star rating. And the performance is positive 10% since the beginning of the year, roughly, which I think not many other equity funds can claim for themselves. So, Stefan, is this just coincidence or is that skill? I hope it's not uh, luck or coincidence, but uh, of course, luck is always needed in uh, investment as well. But um, let me... Uh, explain to you why I think it's not just luck that we did better than the market in, in over the last few years. In order to do that, let me quickly highlight some points in our investment philosophy. We are bottom-up stock pickers with a value bias. So we don't, we don't care really about uh, indices like MSCI or CSI or uh, whatever, FT, F, FTSE 50 or whatever. China index. So we, we really just care about individual companies and we look for superior uh, companies that we, we put together in a portfolio. So that helps us, you know, to be more flexible. We don't need to own stocks in certain areas or certain sectors just because they're in the index. We only own those stocks that we like. And in order to do that, of course, we need uh, to be very disciplined. We need to do a lot of research. And we need a high level of conviction because, as I said, we are very concentrated. We only hold between 20 and 25 stock, stocks at any given time. So we need to know what we own. So we, we um, as I show here, you know, we are happy to share that with investors from time to time, what stocks we own, because that's the only thing we do is investing in single stocks. How do we select these stocks? I mean, an important criteria in selecting the stocks that go into our portfolio is what we call the inner strengths. Inner strengths consist of a, a number of um, quantitative and qualitative factors. Uh, among the, the quantitative is earnings per share growth, but also the return on invested capital. In terms of the more soft factors, we look for clarity and consistency of the strategy of the investee companies but I also want to make sure that they have a culture in place that nurtures integrity. So just give you an example recently, maybe you read the unfortunate negative press about Locking Coffee, the competitor of Starbucks in China, where obviously they were, were cheating and, and, and faking some of, of their um, sales numbers. So it's very important that, you, uh, that we have a company that follows that type of uh, culture. So in terms of, uh, Soft factors, we also look for a franchise. You know, do these companies have a franchise? Do they have a competitive edge that allows them to grow in their niche profitably and strongly 
for the foreseeable future. All this, of course, is very difficult, but it has to be available also at the reasonable price. So we have our own valuation methodology that we developed over the years, and that has been very much the same since 2003. We estimate different factors that we then use in order to come up with a fair value for those companies that we invest. And of course, in order for us to invest, the value of these companies has to be higher than the current share price. Why is that important? Because the weighting in our portfolio is based on the relative attractiveness. Because as I said earlier, we do not follow a benchmark. So how do we decide how much we put in one single stock? So that's all based on the relative attractiveness. Meaning the stocks that have the highest undervaluation where the value is the, the most above the, the current price, those are the stocks that have the highest um, weight in our portfolio. In terms of the companies, as I said, it's, the focus is on entrepreneurial China, meaning uh, stocks that are controlled by the private sector and that are not majority owned by the Chinese government. We do not make macro calls, so cash in our portfolio is really just technical. So we hold a little bit of cash, but as a default, we are fully invested at any given time. Also, we do not employ leverage, also we do not use hedges. We are purely investing in, in good stocks and, and that's all we do. Also, as I said before, we do not have a, a sector allocation. A sector allocation is, is the result of the bottom-up stock picking we do and never a function of top-down decisions. Last but not least, I think the team is important. We have a very good team in place, a good mixture between experience, of Hans Rudolf Schmid, with more than 30 years experience in the investment industry and myself with over 30 years in that business as well, combined with local know-how. We have an analyst team of three analysts in Hong Kong that um, have, some of them have Hong Kong, some have mainland Chinese background, but also they're a bit younger than us. I think that helps us to, to understand the universe of stocks that we look at. Well, thank you, Stefan, for uh, sharing the success factors with us, why uh, your fund is uh, so successful. And I guess, you know, despite all of China's skepticism that we're seeing out there, it still shows that a rigorous portfolio management process, as you are um, uh, doing for your funds, can emphasize what China does really well. And you mentioned Chinese entrepreneurship. And I guess, you know, this is something uh, where uh, we, are, we all agree that uh, Chinese are very entrepreneurial people. And can you maybe share with us a couple of examples of transactions that you just did uh, recently during the Corona crisis that led to your success? Yes, you know, as of course, it's um, difficult to make any short term decisions when such a crisis comes, because as nobody else, we didn't see this crisis come definitely not in this type of, uh, in this magnitude that it has hit the, the globe now. But we believe there were several trends and developments in place that we have identified some time ago. And I think that those trends have materialized much faster than we had ever imagined as a result of this crisis. What do I mean? I mean by that, that talking about e-commerce, online medical services, online gaming, also online education, those are sectors that extremely benefited from the, from the crisis, but those are investments we have made already some time ago because we, we saw that these trends are important and that's, that's where the, the world is going. So let me give you some example. One is obviously Alibaba that I guess everybody knows. So, um, but I want just to say that we invest in the company already in 2016 um, at the price of $71. Meanwhile, that stock is listed in, in trading in the US market at uh, 210 US dollars. Meanwhile, of course, the stock is also listed in Hong Kong and we own the Hong Kong share, but originally we bought the US share at the outset. Then I mentioned the online healthcare. There's, we have two examples that we have invested. One is Alibaba Health, of course, a, a leading online drug store platform and, and also uh, the help in the digitalization of the medical supply chain and, and many other 
uh, important parts of the um, digitalization of the medical world that are active. This stock we bought originally in, in 2018 at the price of seven Hong Kong dollar. Meanwhile, that stock is trading at $20 in Hong Kong. Then the, the other example in the online healthcare is Penang Healthcare. That's a leading online healthcare platform. Obviously, as people were locked up in their homes, but they still needed medical advice. So they, the only thing they could do is obviously uh, con call or contact these online medical um, platforms that would help them, give them advice around the clock. And so those are, are things that uh, happen much faster, I believe, than they would have otherwise without the crisis. Um, this um, stock we bought um, only last year, about one year ago, at $50. And meanwhile, it's uh, trading in Hong Kong at 112 Hong Kong dollars. And Tencent, another very well-known uh, company, uh, all around internet leader, but also a leader in mobile games. And, and as people were sitting home with their kids, a lot of them, of course, were, were happy to use those online games during that lockup period. But also, otherwise, um, Tencent is very much involved in Chinese daily life with over 1 billion monthly active users. Um, through their uh, app, probably WeChat, that some people might know, which is the Chinese um, uh, correspondent of WhatsApp. Tencent we bought already, already in 2013 at um, 93 Hong Kong dollar. Meanwhile, that stock is trading at uh, 412 Hong Kong dollars. And finally, it's online education, education in general, a big topic in China, Chinese households. Meanwhile, spend a lot of their uh, household income on education for the kids because the Chinese do believe in education and believe that. And I think that's also the reason why China is doing so well uh, in compared to other many other countries in the world. TL we bought in uh, 2018 at 37. Meanwhile, the stock is trading at 50 US dollars. Um, so to um, sum up, I mean, we have um, obviously, as you can see here, a very concentrated portfolio. The top 10 uh, stocks make up uh, around 60% of the portfolio and the remaining 14 positions are about 40% of the portfolio. Also, as you can see here, very little cash, only half a percent. So that's what I said earlier. Cash is just uh, a technical liquidity that we need, but we do not make macro calls in terms of um, increasing or decreasing the cash level in the fund when we think the market is going, going down. And would have paid off, as, as we all know, um, you know, if you had uh, raised more cash because the market came back very vigorously and probably one would have missed the recovery in the market had one tried to time it. So I see that really active reallocation into the sectors that performed well during this crisis has clearly shown that your expertise in China has generated alpha in, in these times, you know, especially when markets are moving fast, it seems like active management is still uh, outperforming the market by lengths. So Stefan, your fund is also since recently uh, a PRI signatory of the UN and therefore ESG compliant. Now, there's been some recent criticism about that label and that funds that use this label squeeze more fees out of investors. And what is your take on that? Yeah, I've heard that too. There was some criticism recently because, you know, there's a, a real industry, I think, that has emerged uh, supporting different um, uh, pension funds and asset managers in terms of, um, you know, the taking care of that topic of the ESG of this uh, sustainable investment. And, um, but in our case, I, I can assure investors that we do not charge any additional fee for that. Actually, we couldn't do it. It wouldn't be um, on the Swiss law. You couldn't do that anyway. But we are uh, accessing the available resources that are already accessible to us within the framework of those uh, tools that we use, like information systems such as Bloomberg and other systems that do provide such information already. So no, we, for us, it will not have any impact on the <coughs> cost or, or the total expense ratio of our fund. If there's any cost, it will be covered 
out of the, of the management fees that are charged to the farm. Well, that's very good to hear. So, um, Stefan, thank you very much for sharing your insights and your knowledge with us today. So I would say now uh, let's move to the Q&A session. So there we go, just uh, change the screen around a little bit. So there is one interesting question here that I have for you. Um, maybe some of you or us are aware that some of the leading banks like UBS and Julius Baer have either increased their allocation into China or at least are very, very positive on China. So the question here is, with the outperformance of the China stock markets, would you agree that China has become a new safe haven for investors? Well, definitely China has uh, proven to be quite resilient. It actually has recovered very quickly um, from the crisis and also in, in this respect, done its job as a diversifier in an equity portfolio. So obviously seems to be uh, not correlated as much with the other markets, as, um, which is obviously what investors are looking for. So yes, so we'll see. I mean, that was a, it's a very good start. And uh, so very confident that uh, international investors will start to appreciate the benefit of investing in the Chinese markets going forward. So this week, China started to um, uh, uh, change the lockdown rules a little bit. So they uh, just lifted some of the restrictions, especially in Wuhan and the Hubei province. What has been the experience so far and what implications does that have on your investment strategy? As I described, you know, we are very much long-term investors and we typically do not make short-term moves and, and wait you know, for, for our thesis, investment thesis for different stocks to materialize. Of course, and typically we would you know, sell a, a stock when the inner strength that I described before is weakening and, and buy stocks where the inner strength is strengthening. Most recently, of course, um, in early February, as we saw that this crisis would have a very big impact on international travel. We uh, decided to get out of one of the positions we had, a company called Ctrip or Trip.com, that's listed in the US, but this is to, as a Chinese business, of course, because we, we saw that it would have severe impacts for, for quite some time on the stock. That's why we decided to uh, sell that position. Likewise, we have, um, sold our position in the only bank we had in the portfolio because we expect as a result of the crisis, the non-performing loans and the provisions that banks have to make as a result of that will go up and therefore we have um, sold that position. At the same time, we were able to increase an existing position in a stock that's um, active in uh, food delivery among other things. And so we were able, when the market came down at the beginning, to increase our, our position in, in that stock. Now there is a question about another stock that you have in your portfolio, a CATL, and one of the participants would like to have a little bit more comments on that. Can you give us a little bit more background? Yeah, CATL is, um, is a, a stock that, or a company that's actually one of the largest manufacturers of batteries for electric vehicles and they already are providing those batteries for a large number of, of car manufacturers that are uh, active in the, or pro, are, are building electric vehicles but most recently also there was announcement that was before the crisis of course that um, Tesla wants to build a large factory in, in China and CATL will also provide uh, batteries for um, for Tesla cars uh, made for the Chinese market. And I think that gate gave quite a lot of additional, of course, uh, fantasy to the, I guess, to the, into the stock price. But we have been owning that stock already for quite, quite some time. And, and I think that is, is another example, I would say, you know, where we think that's a, a leader in its industry that fits very well in our portfolio. And we, we bought that with a, with a long-term view because we, 
see that you know the Chinese government is making a lot of efforts in order to um, increase the share of electric vehicles in the in China, uh, as it, of course in order to to fight uh, pollution that is a big problem in in China still. So another question here that I have is uh, more about, about your internal processes, I guess. Um, this is when and how do you interact with the management in your investment decision before and during the investment period? Yes, that's a very good question. You know, because as I said, we are very concentrated and very focused. We only own maximum 25 stocks. Currently we have 23 stocks in the portfolio and the interaction with, with management and, and to meet the management is very important. As I described earlier, in terms of the uh, qualitative factors, I think it's, it's quite important to, to meet with the management in order to understand the culture of, of those companies. So that's where, you know, some of the companies, of course, they are very uh, uh, good in communicating in English, others are less, and that's why we are glad to have a team like we have it in Hong Kong with, with local people, you know, and, and uh, native speakers in, in uh, Mandarin and, and uh, in Cantonese. And that, of course, helps us to interact also with, with those managements that are not typically interacting with uh, international investors. So, but that's a very important part of our um, uh, investment decisions. And of course, the, the ongoing, you know, um, uh, information flow and, and of course, um, yeah, interacting with, with the management wherever possible is very important. There's another very justified comment, I, I think. Um, it says, China focuses more and more on its exporting industry. And if the economy in the US and Europe hasn't recovered yet, how will it affect the China stock market? And how do you think you can still outperform? Definitely. I mean, we, as I mentioned earlier, I think the recovery that we expect in China and also the IMF is expecting will face some headwinds from the slowdown in the, uh, or actually a recession more rather in, in the global economies. And that will be felt in China as well. But um, as you know, that about 20% of the Chinese GDP is, is actually exports. When it comes to our portfolio, I can assure investors that we have a very much a domestic focus. You know, the, the, thing, the, the China story for us is mostly a domestic story. The market is 1.4 billion people, much bigger than Europe and, you know, and US together. And we think that's the important focus of, of our fund. And if you look at our fund and also some of the stock positions I described earlier, be it e-commerce or, or be it uh, online healthcare or, or, or um, Tencent with online payment, uh, video games, that's all very much targeted to the, to the domestic market. And I think that's where we see the huge potential. And I guess that's also the reason why we, we did better among other factors I described earlier, but we have very little exposure to um, international exposure in our, in our fund. Um, it's, um, we have basically three positions, I think, that have, are exposed uh, to um, exports um, and in the to in the electronic sector and um, and we have one in the in the white goods sector that has about 40 percent of their sales are international but overall for the whole fund that's um, less i think that's less than about five percent of the total fund in, in stocks that are, are uh, um, exposed to to export that's great so we have come to the end of our webinar it's already 11 o'clock uh, there is one a couple of more questions here uh, regarding the five-year plan in china and some questions about renewable energy i think we could probably catch up one by one with uh, the participants afterwards on that one so um I, i'd say stay healthy everybody uh thank you very much for dialing in to our webinar and we hope to see you again soon thank you thank you very much